So, meine Damen und Herren, ich hoffe, das Mittagessen hat Ihnen gebundet und Sie hatten ausreichend Zeit für Diskussionen. Die Vormittagssession war, glaube ich, anregend genug, um genügend Stoff für viele Diskussionen zu liefern. Mein Name ist Joachim Heberle. Ich bin auch Mitglied des Gremiums Ombudsmann für die Wissenschaft. Ich werde jetzt die Nachmittagssession auf Englisch einführen because we have the pleasure uh, to have uh, now an international setting uh, with the next, uh, in, within the next session, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to have two exceptional speakers and personalities uh, who made it possible, uh, despite their uh, many obligations uh, they have, to come over to Berlin. The, res the German uh, Ombudsman for Research is uh, embedded in, ten, in an international network of research integrity. And I'm delighted that we succeeded to attract these two personalities uh, from abroad in our session on the impact of power and prevention of power abuse in higher education and research environments. So let me just say a few words about our Uh, first speaker, which is Lex Bauter from Freie Universität, not in Berlin, but in Amsterdam. Uh, Lex uh, is a professor of epidemiology and became a, a scientific director of the EMGO Plus, Institute for Health and Care at the uh, VU, so the FU of Freie University Medical Center in Amsterdam. He was an editor, and this is also a very important point in the discussion, as we will hear about uh, later. He was an editor and editor-in-chief of the Cochrane Collaboration Book uh, Back Review Group from 2006 and until 2013. He was the rector magnificus of the Freie Universität in Amsterdam, which relates back to the discussion that we had uh, before lunch. As rector, Lex pleaded for attention for the social impact of research and became interested in the dilemmas around research integrity. And here we are uh, in his topic. He also uh, uh, professionalized this because he became a, a, a professorship that became tenured in 2014 where uh, the scope was broadened to methodology and integrity. He is currently involved in teaching and research regarding responsible conduct of research. And this will be mainly the topic of his presentation. In 2017, Lex Bauter was appointed as member of the Council for Medical Research of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2017, and this is uh, where a few of us uh, uh, attended also, he organized and co-chaired the Fifth World Conference in, on Research Integrity in Amsterdam and became chair of the World Conferences on Research Integrity Foundation. So it's a great pleasure, Lex, uh, to have you here, wherever you are. Please <laughs> join our stage and uh, a hearty welcome. Well, thank you for this kind and, and slightly embarrassing introduction. Uh, it, it, it's all true, but I don't like to boost about all these things. Um, and I have to apologize, ladies and gentlemen, for talking in English to you. I could try German, but I cannot recommend it. My German is not good enough for this, but bear with me. I'll try to do it in English as clear as I can. My topic of today, as alluded to already, is what can research institutes like universities and university medical centers, what can they do to foster research integrity? And, and the root is manifold of this topic. One root is in the Dutch Code of Conduct, uh, like where in the DFK Code, there is a chapter on duties of care for institutions. What can and should institutions do to help the researchers to get their act together and to uh, work responsibly uh, on the ground in the labs. So, so that is the topic. And I will tell to you that not the FFP, the fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism are the most important, but the questionable research practices due to their high, high, high prevalence. And the th second point is what I want to, to get across is that researchers need support for preventing questionable research practices. They cannot do that on their own. They're, they're embedded in the system. Um, 
also researchers are human and humans are social animals and we work in groups and we are so easily influenced by what happens around us and pressure from outside. And then finally, I will list eight duties of care of institutions and give some interesting, I hope there will be interesting examples. Now this picture is, is not a scientist trying to commit suicide, uh, <laughs> it's just a stock picture um, uh, of the homepage of the uh, Amsterdam, of the academic climate, research climate study Amsterdam. Um, that has been a project we have been running in the two Amsterdam universities and the two university medical centers. All scientists were invited to participate. There were surveys, there were focus groups, interviews, there, there was a lot. I'm not going to tell everything, but I'm raising here one example and later on another one. And that is, in that study, and, and here is the paper where it is described, in that study we asked the scientists um, of a list of 60 misbehaviors, going from fabrication to, to less serious stuff like p-hacking and, and selective reporting and not asking for acknowledgement and so on and so forth. Two questions. Each item, how often do you believe that it occurs? Frequency. Second question was, when it occurs, what is the damage to validity to the truth finding? And then we multiply the two to get an, an aggregate ranking of wrongdoings, of misbehavior in science. And here it is. On top, like happens in many international studies as well, is bad mentoring and supervision. That, that is a real root cause of many stuff is going wrong, according to these scientists. And the second one is, uh, I, I could say, uh, an intellectual conflict of interest. Let, be a, carried away by your own convictions and your pet theories and so on and so forth. That's human and it, it happens to all of us all the time, but we need to fight it back. We need to resist against it and, and don't exaggerate that. Number three is having an inadequate research, uh, research design and having poor measurement instruments. When you start early, you can prove everything. Yeah, my field is clinical research. It's so easy to compare a new drug to an old drug, which is not suitable for these patients, and then to be, just to be sure you dose it a bit too low, and then I know already who's going to win. Or alternatively, use a measurement instrument which is irrelevant, but is giving an, a, a huge result on, on, on the efficacy of the drug you're testing. So when designing a study, it can already start to go wrong. Number four was, uh, and that is the root cause of the current replication crisis, that is not publish valid negative studies. I will allude to that later on again. And number five was, uh, don't give enough attention to the stuff and the methods and the labs and the training and the expertise you use. Now these things are the top five. Only in the second half of the top 60 of this study appeared falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism. The first two, because they're so rare, plagiarism is not rare, but has no, not, no influence on, on, on truth finding. It has an influence on the trust people have in science, but not on truth finding. So th this is my plea why I believe questionable research practices are so important. And this is in, in an abstract way what we are doing. Uh, here you see the aggregate effect eh, that's going along the y-axis. Uh, here are the questionable research practices. There are so many that on the aggregate they do a lot of wrong to the quality of science. And this is where we're looking all the time, the FFP story. So we should shift that. The light, is my conviction, should be much more on the top of the mountain. Now, how come that people are not behaving well? Well, there are three categories of difficulties. It's, of course, all have to do with the moral compass we all have in our head. And, and this is a picture of the moral compass in, in our head. Uh, it's, of course, it has to do with the individual. Uh, the way you were raised, uh, the culture you were raised in, maybe some genetic influence as well, schooling you had, and so forth. 
And then there is the research climate. Th that is the most important uh, part of it. Uh, uh, we, in this Amsterdam study I told you about, uh, the, the majority of, of the, the variation could be complained by factors which are in the domain of the research climate locally in the labs in the uh, departments. And then you have the perverse incentives in the system of science. The, 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 the hyper-competition, the, the fact that we take counting publications and, and uh, citations so serious uh, and make that have a lot of consequences. So there are the reasons and all together, and now I exaggerate a little bit but not too much, it might work like this. We all know that positive results are wonderful, especially when they are spectacular. We, we would love to have them. And, and the truth is that we hardly bother anymore to publish the negative results that you can imagine. It gives a big distortion in, in the uh, scientific literature. Um, positive results get, get you high impact publications, a lot of citations, media attention, and these all three help you to your next grant. And when you're lucky, you want to remain in academia to your tenure. Now, the good news in a cynical way is that there is a whole toolkit a toolkit of questionable research practices and research misconduct, and all these tools can help you enormously to get positive results. In fact, they're meant to make positive results, and they do that really, really effectively. So the point is that most positive results are either chance findings, because you don't bother to publish the negative findings, or they're cooked and trimmed uh, by stuff in the toolkit. And that's the reason we are facing a replication crisis, and that's the reason you should never trust, trust one single study before it is being replicated. Now, these are some of these beautiful tools in the toolkit. Uh, I, I alluded to selective reporting already. It's a real powerful tool. Uh, then you have to pull the tool of low power. You do many, many small studies and you wait until a miracle happens and one is positive in your favorite direction. You publish that one, forget about the rest. It works wonderfully well. Many scientists know how to do it. Uh, then you have p-hacking. Yeah, I'm, I'm half of a statistician um, and my favorite biostatistician always says, if you torture your data enough, they will always confess. <laughs> and that is what happens. I've, I've run trials with randomized de of random, randomly selected data sets, and a good statistician can always tease out a nice table out of that. It's not easy. It's, it's, it is easy. It is not difficult. And then you have the, 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 the sport of harking. That's nice as well. Uh, it's, it's hypothesizing after re the results are known. We do that all the time. Just storytelling. You have some interesting data, and then you make up a story. And this king, king knew it already. He first shoots his arrow, and then the lackey makes sure that he hits the bullet all the time. And that's what you do when you are harking. And this is the reason uh, pre-registration and all modes of open science are so important, because they're meant to prevent this type of stuff. And this is the rest of the toolkit. D don't use it, but it's ent entertaining to read it. These are a few uh, clever social scientists from Tilburg University and they described 34 tools how to cook and trim your data to get positive results. And they all work guaranteed wonderfully well. I come to the eight things I believe that research institutions can and indeed should do. Um, and on a high level, uh, this is codified. Yeah, we have this European code, you all know that most likely. And then you have your national codes, your favorite national codes. I, I, I looked for it uh, when I was preparing this lecture, and I believe that this is your national code, but I'm not completely sure. Uh, it's not from the universities, but from the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, but that's, that's okay as it is, of course. Uh, and these codes tell you what to do uh, on a high level. They not go in the nitty, nitty de details, because they are meant for all disciplines. They're meant for all disciplines, and, and they don't help for uh, the details of a specific discipline. So you need local codes as well. You, you need to develop codes to local codes to disciplinary codes, and so on and so forth. And I'll give you two examples. Um, this is an example I've been involved with myself. Uh, before, I, uh, earlier in my career, I was uh, 
uh, leading the Amsterdam Public Health Institute, and there we had what we called a quality handbook. That was a whole box of standard operating procedures and checklists, how to do this, how to do that, how to do that. Later I recognized that th these were all guidelines for responsible conduct of research. Young investigators, they loved them. And in fact, they, that's good because they were responsible for maintaining the toolbox. And they were revising the stuff, adding new tools, and it's, it's really, it, it's working quite well. We're now 25 years down the line. It's working quite well. It's quite comprehensive for public health and primary care research. It's not helping you in other types of research, of course. And then my discipline that has been taught already is epidemiology. Uh, and we have, with the Dutch Society of Epidemiologists, we made a code of conduct for them as well. This is an example of a disciplinary code. And you have many of them for all types of disciplines. Number two, institutions, I believe, should have fair procedures for handling allegations. And that's not easy. I've been there as a rector of an institution. I know it's difficult, but, but you need to have them. And then the, the line is narrow. You need to treat whistleblowers well. You need to treat them really well. That is important. But also, when you have a malicious whistleblower, and they do exist, you need to catch them, yeah, which is not easy at all. Um, and then, of course, you need to also protect the people uh, against whom the allegations are made. Because normally you are not guilty until proven guilty, but in research integrity uh, allegations, it's the other way around. You are guilty until proven uh, not guilty. And that is not nice for people. That is awful for people. And in fact, the, the guy I wrote this article with on, on this topic a few years ago, he worked in Berlin as a postdoc and he got a malicious uh, false allegation against his work. It was awful for him. It, it cost him th three, four years of his career. He defended, he went from one committee to the other. He was not guilty of anything, but it was really awful for him and it put him behind in his career development. So these, these things are serious and, and they're not easy. Um, you need at least to have a good whistleblower protection code, uh, but, but never believe that that solves the issue. It, it doesn't. Being a whistleblower is also dangerous. It, it often does not end well for whistleblowers. There is not that much research on it, but you can say the Office of Research Integrity in the US, they, they did the best research, but it was long ago, uh, and they showed that three quarters of the whistleblowers experienced really, really bad consequences of the fact that they blew the whistle like being fired, by being set back in their careers, by getting mental health problems or getting even physical health problems. So it's a difficult and tough decision to become a whistleblower. And it's so good that there are nowadays confidential counselors or ombudspersons available uh, to guide you through these uh, things. And recently, um, maybe you know it already, but I can recommend it if you do not know it. It's an interesting article of a bunch of focus group interviews and, and also uh, in-depth interviews among scientists or, of, of different levels of seniority. Um, and it was, when do you decide to blow the whistle and when do you look the, others, the, the other way? And they said, well, it depends. Hey, that's a good answer to almost any question, so that's the answer here as well. It depends on what is the how important is, what is the severity of the wrongdoing, of the misbehavior, and it depends on how often can it get, how awful can it get for you. When it's not important and not big deal uh, as far as consequences are expected, well, it's low impact on science, low impact on research, then you can do what you like. Um, when the impact on your life is l large, but on science is, is low, please don't blow the whistle. And that doesn't make sense. When the impact on science is high and the concern for yourself is low, then it's obvious that you should blow the whistle. And this is the most difficult. It takes courageous people, really courageous people, to blow the whistle. We, we need them because for the big FFP, 
typically you need whistleblowers to, to, to get notice of what is happening. So this, this is a nice way to look around it. Number three, uh, and, and I, I, that, this, this one is near to my heart as well. Um, we need to provide good mentoring and training for responsible conduct of research. We are trying. Most universities nowadays have uh, PhD courses or postdocs courses in research integrity. Um, some universities even made them mandatory, which is not a bad idea. Um, but the funny thing is, remember that bad supervision and mentoring is on top of the list of, of, of stuff that's going wrong on the ranking I showed you. In my country, you don't need a license to supervise. You, you can just start with your own PhD student when you have a grant for it, you can just start. And it's stupid. When, when you want to teach in, in, in primary school, in high school, nowadays even in university, you need diplomas and trainings and everything, but there is nothing for, for helping PhD students. And it's such an important task. It's also such a difficult task. It's rewarding, but it's really difficult. And we, I believe we need a license to supervise. And in this Amsterdam study uh, I told you about, uh, there is also a part where we did a pilot study. It's called Superb Supervision. And it's about role modeling, it's about combining good mentoring skills and good research integrity skills. It's, it's with hands-on training because uh, many scientists have no clue how you do a pre-registration or, or uh, uh, cannot promote preprints and don't, do not understand how it all works. So you need some practical training there as well. And it's, it's not yet mandatory in my university, but I'm pushing it in that direction. But it's now officially announced as one of the course options you can get when you have your first PhD student. And they love it, the supervisors. In fact, we're now working on, on a similar course for um, the elderly guys uh, and, 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 and ladies, of course, as well, who have already had many PhD students uh, that did not make them necessarily good supervisors, of course. Four, five, and six on one slide, um, because I want to end on time and, and we'll give the floor to Anna on time. Um, four is have good methodological and statistical support. Science is difficult, it's not easy. And the method and the statistics part is complex. You need guidance there and your institution needs to provide these facilities. Uh, and many of the questionable research practices, uh, like, like the p-hacking for instance, they are in the domain of bad methods and bad statistics. Have a system of internal audits. Now this one is not so popular in, in, in most research institutes because they're, they're typically rather anarchistic uh, environments, universities, uh, and people don't like to be checked. But it is a good idea. Y you should give it a light touch it's not like the police visiting your lab. It's like a bunch of colleagues interesting in your work trying to help you to improve. And on, on, on the spot, this committee, and, and we do it with senior and junior scientists combined, the committee members, they learn the most. So it's, it's, it's quite rewarding. And it's good for quality assurance, I believe. So internal audits, audits it's not popular, but it should be. And then number six is uh, the data management and data storage domain. Uh, that is developing now quite, quite well and quite neatly, uh, mainly partly also because the European Union, Union is so pressing in the direction of data management and data curation. Um, that's developing well, but still many institutions have not yet their act together in this domain. And they should. It's one of their duties of care. I'm not going to tell you about the FAIR principles, you all know about them, of course, they're part of the, the, the open science and open research dogmas which are so popular nowadays and they're really good ideas. And yes, they have some bearing on research integrity because when data sets are open, when protocols are available, everyone worldwide can check your work and that is good. And sometimes people are checking work and uh, discover that something is really wrong, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not on purpose, but then you can improve the record uh, together. The penultimate one is the perverse incentives in the reward system. 
like counting citations and publications too much. There's nothing wrong with counting citations and, and talking about huge indexes, but it's wrong to make that a single message because people then start to believe that this is the only thing that matters. That is not true. Uh, you know most likely the Dora and the Leiden Manifesto maybe, they all say tone down a little bit of all these, these, these metrics in, in, in science. And in the World Conferences on Research Integrity in Hong Kong in the last edition, June last year, we made five Hong Kong principles. And the idea of the principles is how should we assess researchers for hiring, for promotion, uh, that type of stuff. Um, with a view to promote research integrity and not with a view to damage research integrity. And these are the principles. Assess responsible research practices, like I've been alluding to during this lecture. Value complete reporting against the selective reporting thing. Reward the practice of open science because then it's, it's usable, it's checkable, it's controllable. Acknowledge a broad range of research activity. Someone doing systematic reviews or curating big data sets and biobanks, that is research as well. And we need to reward that as well. And the final one, recognize essential other tasks like peer review and, and mentoring, and that has been alluded to as well. So now this is under development. The website uh, is about to be open, so please, when the website is available, endorse the Hong Kong principle and start using it in your own institution. It's, it's really important, we believe. I end with the most difficult one, and this is the most difficult one. Um, promote an open research climate. That's, that's something like telling to a kid, please be spontaneous, or please don't be afraid. That's not going to work. Fostering an open climate is, is not easy, but it's so important. And I want to point out, and maybe some of you may have discovered that already, the Wellcome Trust, they have issued a wonderful report on, on surveys, focus group interviews, interviews on, on these issues, what the researchers themselves de think about the culture and think about how it can be improved. It's, it's really important. It's not easy, but we need an open atmosphere where we can uh, report our mistakes, blame-free reporting without being punished, and where we can talk about our dilemmas and our doubts, and where we have developed a language to talk about something you, you, you think that a colleague might have done wrong. That's not easy. When you say, I believe you you have an allegation of research integrity, you're not behaving properly. That's not a good, the good language. The language is, can I please help you? I, I believe that I saw something that can be improved in your work. And that might work. So, and people need to practice the language. And, and we have courses where we have mental, moral case deliberation methods to, to train people to talk about these, these, these issues. This is an article, again, from this Amsterdam uh, research climate study. Uh, it's dealing with research integrity. For sake of time, I'm going to skip it now. These are a few findings out of it. Um, and when you want to read a little bit more about what I told, this is a small article that has been uh, published a few weeks ago on it. It's, in essence, uh, the, the talk of today. Um, it's open access, of course, and it's being made available to the organizers, so they will put it on the website, most likely, like they will put on the website also uh, my presentation with below the slides all the references the, to, to articles, to books, to YouTube videos, to, to whatever you have. Now, my, I end with a small uh, free publicity spot. Uh, this is the SOP for RI Consortium. It's one of the Horizon 2020 projects. And we are working on tools how institutes can fulfill their duties of care. They're not yet ready. The first batch will be ready in a year. But please check out this website because it will make clear what guidelines, what checklists, what standard operating procedures are available to develop policy and measures on an institutional level. This is the website of the World Conferences on Research Integrity. Um, six we have so far. All the lectures, links to videos, all the PowerPoint presentations are there. It's a rich source of information. And if you like to travel uh, for professional purposes, please come to Cape Town, uh, because that is where the next World Conference is. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Lex, for this wonderful presentation. Just a, a, a short comment from my side. I, I think what is very important uh, to many of us is really the language, to talk to the people in a, in a language that is appropriate. Because scientists are usually very sensitive to misconducting these things and get emotional about these things. So try to tone down. I think that's very important. Thank you very much. We have, we have time for a few pressing questions. Please use the standing microphone if you have. Yes, please. Gerhard Dannemann, Humboldt University. A brilliant presentation, one comment of dissent. Plagiarism does affect the truth in science. It um, incapacitates falsification. You just copy without checking. There's a very, very serious example of that, which was revealed in 2017 by a team of researchers who had studied um, a letter to the editor written in 1980 about opioid addiction being rare during hospitalization, which was cited 431 times as evidence that opioids do not make addictive. We have a huge opioid crisis, 400,000 dead people. Plagiarism can kill. Yeah, good, good point. Um, what I meant was more uh, an, uh, on a naive level. Uh, when something is true and you tell it again, it's still true. And when something is not true and you tell it again, it's still not true. And of course, you're right, you need to check that. Uh, and there is one exception uh, I make for myself. I'm in a business of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Uh, when you do um, a meta-analysis, then plagiarism uh, can lead to difficulties because you're counting the same data, data set twice or three times or even five times because you don't know where the data are coming from. So th th that's an exception I, I accept. Um, and to be completely clear, I didn't want to advertise uh, to plagiarize. <laughs> um, please bear with me. Uh, when I'm lecturing, I'm, I'm always saying that I believe I never had an original idea and I'm plagiarizing all the time, but usually I forgot who I'm plagiarizing. So, and I believe we all do that. So we, we need to be a bit humble about that as well. Some more questions? Yes, Helga Nolte, Uni Hamburg. Uh, thank you, Lex, for this interesting and very um, yeah, very nice uh, presentation. Just a practical question. We had uh, the Singapore statement and the Montreal statement as the outcomes from the previous world conferences. And is this uh, Hong Kong principles paper or statement or is this available in the same form or somewhere or it's still in the work progress? Yeah, that, that's a really nice question. So it gave me the opportunity to, to, to tell a little bit more about it. Um, the point is the Hong Kong uh, principles are fixed and published as a preprint. There is now a journal uh, who is seriously uh, uh, being in the process of accepting or rejecting it. We have to wait for that. But the preprint is available. Um, in a few weeks, maybe only in one week, on the website of the foundation there will be a page uh, where the Hong Kong principles are. It's in the same list as what you alluded to, the Singapore, the Montreal, and the Hong Kong. And, and we also have the Amsterdam agenda. The, you forgot that one. It's near to my heart again. Um, and then um, you can um, endorse it, either as an individual or as an institution. It's not a legal endorsement, of course, but then you say, hmm, this is a pretty good idea. I'm going to try to, to implement it. Yep, and that's, that's the idea. And it's a, bit, a, bit, a little bit plagiarized from, from DORA. They have endorsements as well, and, and we like that. So we want endorsements for the Hong Kong principle as well. So it's, it's one of the lists of the World Conferences. Thank you. Hello, my name is Beate Sampasong. I'm from Nijmegen Max Planck Institute. Uh, thank you for a really inspiring talk. Um, you mentioned that actually that university teachers do not get any preparation before they can supervise students. And I wanted to say actually in the Netherlands there are these basic and senior teaching qualifications and especially in the UK you have a very, very formalized standard now before you can supervise students which is the fellow of the Higher Education Academy where you actually get training now about how to supervise students, how to deal with complaints, with tutoring, with problems, with uh, dealing with private information that is shared with you. 
And uh, I, I was wondering how you see the future of this in the existence now of actual programs that exist in other European countries. Yeah. Yeah, a really good point. Uh, we do have certification now for teaching in universities, and, and that includes also uh, being the supervisor and mentor of master and bachelor students. That, that's true. What I was alluding to, that, that you, for PhD students, th there is nothing. And, and, and having a PhD student is, is, is rather different from having a master's student. It, it might not be that different, but it's, it's, it's rather different. It's for a long episode. Uh, there, there are many things involved. Uh, and there are some um, uh, optional courses available in, in some universities for that, but these are mainly focusing on the soft skills, the soft skills of being a mentor, of, 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 of giving feedback in a proper way, uh, in taking care of your students, and they're all wonderful. But my point was that want, we want to take uh, action to promote responsible conduct of research, we need training for PhD supervisors that is zooming in on what you need to maintain responsible conduct of research. And, and that is the superb supervision course I alluded to. Um, it's experimental, it's not yet mandatory, but now it's, it's widely available in Amsterdam and, and some other cities are, are thinking to, to copy the, the, the idea. That is what I'm trying to say. Thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Thank you very much, Lex. I'm, I'm afraid we have to move on, so thanks again for your wonderful presentation. Thank you.